Hey everyone, welcome to Token Topics. ISO 2022 is about to kick into high gear this November. I have some exciting information that you're not going to want to miss that points to November as a very special month, November to remember. Also, there's great news about X receiving a license to begin implementing cryptocurrencies into the platform. That is excellent. We're going to look into that. Also, I'm going to do a deep dive into distributive ledger technology. What is it? for educational purposes. If you do enjoy the video, please do hit the like, subscribe to stay up to date. Let's go ahead and dive in. All right, first I wanna show the audience this awesome Facebook group that I came across, and I'm gonna put the link to it down below. And I highly recommend that you check it out and join. Um, it's called Crypto and Technology, and all kinds of great information. There's a lot of information pointing to November, as a month to remember. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in. And again, the, the link to the group is in the description. Check it out. This is from ISO 2022 Adoption and Transaction Manager. And as you can see here, November is definitely a month that we need to be paying attention to. The coexistence of formats MT and ISO 2022 introduces the need for readiness, interoperability, and data integrity. Now, we know if you've been subscribed to the channel, I've gone over the different dates. There's been postponements, you know, changes, but it's looking like November. We're definitely going to start to see something, hopefully. Um, but 2025, I know for a fact, that's when they're going to be going live with Fedwire and they're going to be really hitting the gas on cross-border payments. They're really going to be hitting the gas on utility. Um, so anywhere between, I would say, November all the way through 2025, we need to be ready because anything can happen. You know, you still have uh, the clarity over uh, the Ripple lawsuit, you know, but XRP in itself is not a security. I think that's been clarified. So I don't see why some of these companies, these financial institutions around the world would not want to use XRP. This is good for all the ISO 2022, for Corda, for XDC, and for, you know, other, hopefully we're going to see some true utility. But wow, look at this by the regulatory changes, which will become effective globally on the 19th of November, the SWIFT 2023 functionality can be activated via a central switch. The new functionality can be switched on and then switched off in the application allowing to view and test the functionality before activation date in 2023. So they can test it before. I mean, they're, they're stating that this November, it's on. All right, here's more great news. This is from the same Facebook group. European banks to be ready for a connection and operation with the new ECMS, which launches in November. Now, what is the ECMS? ECMS is a unified system for management, managing assets, uses collateral and Euro system credit. Now, it was originally planned to launch in April, so this is excellent news that it's going to be this year. So here we have 19 banks. From November of 2023, all interactions related to collateral management between banks and their communities will be carried out using the new ECMS. New ISO 2022 messaging, banks can use the whole solution or pick up the components that they need depending on the requirements. I guess that would be the acceleration phase. Uh, migration to the new uh, ECMS will be an immediate switch over in November. There we have it, immediate. Here we have this, another picture pointing to November. This is JP Morgan ISO 2022 channel users. So the ISO 2022 messaging standard presents unique opportunities for our corporate clients. While it's not mandatory for clients using JP Morgan's channel or Swift corporate CUG, migrating to the ISO 2022 is a great opportunity to capture rich data benefits for your business corporate clients can use the enhanced data model to empower more efficient reconciliation, enhance invoice information at scale, and fewer manual processes. Please be aware, look at this right here, please be aware that we do plan to align with published industry guidance and not enable enhanced data elements before the target date. So right here, target date, again, November. Now I want to show you some information on SEPA from that group, but let's learn what is SEPA. So single euro payments area, SEPA, 
Thanks to the single Euro payments area, customers can make cashless Euro payments via credit transferred and direct debit to anywhere in the European Union, as well as a number of non-EU countries. In fact, it's safe, efficient way, just like national payments. SIPA was introduced for credit transfers in 2008, followed by direct debits in 2009, and fully implemented by 2014 in Euro area. So, okay, so we know it's a form of payment. All right, now I want to show you this. So here we have this little clip from Promatis. In November 2023, SIPA will migrate to the ISO 2022 standard, a date that is receiving worldwide attention. Now, according to a study, however, only 18% of companies surveyed worldwide are considering the transition at that time. Now, remember, I said it's like hitting a gas pedal. It's going to be in stages. So you might say, oh, it's only 18%. Most likely, we're going to see a huge price difference because even that percentage is going to strike some utility. Now, 2025, going to 2025, everybody's got to be on board. That's kind of like, hey, you're either with us or you're not with us. So people, are, their companies are not going to have a choice is what I'm saying. But this is definitely good news for November. In fact, let's go ahead and dive into this article. So we go down here, we can see here. So, all right, we know that November is, is going to be a hot month, but even though only 18% surveyed worldwide considering transition, 42% have no plans at all regarding this drastic transition. However, they're going to have to be on board. However, the fact that the change is coming becomes clear with SWIFT's indication that as of 2025, the previous SWIFT standard MT messages on a SWIFT platform would be decommissioned. So they're not going to have a choice. A lot of people want Gary Gensler gone. This is put out by you today. So crypto proponents call out SEC chair. Besides a call from Scaramucci asking the SEC chair to resign his position, a number of crypto proponents have also intensified this call in the past years, as many believe the commission under Gensler has stifled innovation. While the tone cracking down on cryptocurrencies predates Gensler era, since his ascension in office, the top regulator has notably upheld the firm stance that many industry leaders are calling a regulation by enforcement strategy. While Scaramucci's call has been verbal, lawmakers have gone ahead to move proactive with a bill introduced that can pave the way for the reorganization of the SEC as a whole. Um, you know, I stated for a while that we need a reform. The SEC has to be gutted and redone. Moving along, here we go, Elon. In a recent development, the popular social media platform formerly known as Twitter, now referred to as X, has successfully obtained the Rhode Island Currency Transmitter License in the United States. The approval of this license, August 28th, as indicated by data on a nat nationwide multi-state licensing system, allows X to offer crypto payments and trading services to its users. The acquisition of this license is significant as it authorizes X to engage in activities related to virtual assets on behalf of its users. This includes features such as storing, transferring, and exchanging digital assets within a platform with a large use user base. This license enables X to cater to the needs of millions of users facilitating crypto transactions securely. The Rhode Island uh, Currency Transmitter license not only grants X the ability to handle virtual currency, but also allows them to manage transactions associated with it on behalf of others. This license is generally held by various service providers in the crypto industry, including crypto exchanges, wallets, and payment processors. This new development positions X to potentially revolutionize the way its users interact with cryptocurrency, bringing crypto payments and trading to a wider audience globally. Extremely bullish. And most likely, the ones that are talked about on this channel will be integrated into X. It's not just going to be one. It's going to be a bunch of them. And here is the proof of it. You can see the currency transmitter license. If you're wanting to learn about blockchain technology, distributive ledger technology, this is an excellent piece. This is posted by Giorgio Torre. A distributive ledger is the consensus of replicated, shared, and synchronized digital data that is geographically spread across many sites, countries, or institutions.
Today, the banking sector and government bodies are leveraging blockchain and DLTs in general to provide these services to peers. Which types of DLTs do they use? Well, that depends on their use case, on their specific case. And that brings us back to it's not going to be a one-chain world. There's going to be multiple distributive ledger technologies all harmonizing and working together. Now, this what he put down here is excellent information. Let's go ahead and dive in and see what this is about. So here, all right, so there's great information here. So about a ledger, distributed. All network participants have a full copy of the ledger, full transparency. Anonymous, the identifier participates either pseudo-anonymous or anonymous. Timestamp, transaction timestamp is recorded on the block. Consensus-based, network participants agreed to validity of the records. Immutable. Any validated records are reversible and cannot be changed. Secure. All records are individually encrypted and programmable. A blockchain is programmable through the use of smart contracts. Let's continue here. So you can see here the DLT-based transaction relies on three main components. There's peer nodes, minor nodes, and the ledger itself. And you can read through. I'm going to put the PDF in the description below so you can look through all this. But here we go. Let's go ahead and move along here. All right, so public blockchains are public, and anyone can join in them and validate transactions. So what, what is a private blockchain, you might ask? They are restricted and usually limited to business networks. A single entity or consortium controls membership. Permissionless blockchains have no restrictions on processes. processors. Consortium blockchains is a private blockchain with limited access to a particular group, eliminating the risk that come with just one entity controlling the network on a private blockchain. Hybrid blockchains, being a combination of both public blockchain and private blockchain, such as the XDC uh, network right there. And it lets organizations set up private permission-based systems alongside a public permissionless system, allowing them to control and access specific data stored in a blockchain, what the data will be open publicly. Permissioned blockchains are limited to a select set of users who are granted identities using certificates. So, you know that's important information it gives you an idea of all the different types of blockchains all right let's go ahead and continue here so here you have the difference shown another door, uh, diagram public blockchain consortium blockchain private blockchain all right so enterprises and banks use private permission architecture to optimize network openness and scalability that's why some distributive ledgers when they don't have that privacy feature you know, they want a true privacy built into the chain, okay? Um, you know, some blockchains, it might offer private, but it's really a side chain. So, you know, there's different, all these institutions, they're going to be able to pick the blockchain that's going to meet their specific needs, you know, as we talked about. So enterprises and banks use private permission architecture to optimize openness and scalability. So permissionless, anyone can join in. Think about that, permissionless. So that gives you an idea. Hosted on public servers, anonymous, high resilient, low scalability. Then you have uh, permissioned. Anyone can join in. Only authorized and known participants can write and commit medium scalability. And only authorized participants can join and read. Only network operator can write and com uh, commit very high scalability. And that's the private feature. All right. So you got the private and you have the public feature. List of advantages and disadvantages and use cases for each blockchain architecture. So there's your advantages. There you have your disadvantages of the different types. Right here we have blockchain consists of five layers, hardware infrastructure layer, data layer, network layer, consensus layer, and application layer. And off the right, you can see proof of work, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, proof of importance, proof of capacity, Proof of elapsed time, proof of authority, proof of burn, and Byzantine fault tolerance. This is really helping you. Again, like I said, it's in the description. You can look through this and study it. All right, so the blockchain trilemma refers to widely held belief that decentralized networks can only provide two or three benefits at any given time with respect to decentralization, security, and scalability. However, there are two ways to rationalize the issue on layer uh, one and layer two blockchains. So you got real world services, off chain interoperability, but it's all connected to security, decentralization, and scalability. 
Well, everyone, that's all I have for the video. I want to say thank you for watching another edition of Token Topics.